Go ahead. My name is Steve Cotherman, and I am uh, director of the Madeline Island Museum. We're part of the Wisconsin Historical Society. And I understand you're going to use this in a documentary, and that's just Peachy Keen with me. All right, good. <laughs> you got that on. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the history of this island? Well, the, I, the island is a, is a really important um, cultural... All right, you got... Yeah, the, the first people on this island w weren't Europeans. Well, who were the first humans to migrate to this island? Well, we don't know specifically who they were, um, but we're pretty sure that there, there's been human occupation of this end of Lake Superior for probably thousands of years, um, corresponding to the, the comings and goings of the Ice Age. Uh, what we do know is that by the... 1500s, you begin to see a whole lot of displacement and movements of peoples, and this corresponds to the arrival of Europeans on the East Coast. So as they arrive on the East Coast, they begin to displace Indian tribes there, and then they they move west, and they move north and south, and they, they displace other peoples, and it just, it just happens over time. And we know that on Madeline Island, before the Ojibwe, uh, there were Huron and Ottawa and other uh, tribes that moved into this area from the east. The Ojibwe, by some accounts, are here by 1500. By other accounts, which would be primarily written European accounts, they're not placed here before 1650. So it depends on who you're talking to on that. But it's been occupied by the Ojibwe for hundreds of years, that's fair to say. And, and the most important part is for the Ojibwe, Madeline Island is an incredibly sacred place. I like to use the analogy that Madeline Island is to the Ojibwe what the Vatican is to Catholics, or Mecca is to Islam. I mean, it's the center of their uh, spiritual universe. And it all, and it all traces back to um, the stories that they tell about their migration from the East Coast. Uh, and I don't know a lot about the ins and outs of how, how those stories get told properly and how they work, but the, the bottom line is if you connect their oral traditions to the written history of North America, you begin to see that there, it makes some sense, the stories that, that the Ojibwe tell about how they move from the east to western Lake Superior, and it corresponds to the arrival of Europeans and people sort of bumping into each other and, and displacing uh, different tribal groups over time. Without stepping on the lines of a, a Native American, what you said about it being a spiritual center, is there any more you could tell me about that? Well, just, just from the stories that I've heard um, and some of the reading that we've, that we've been able to do over the years, when, when that migration story um, dictates that, uh, that over time the Ojibwe move from the east to the west and that the journey takes a certain amount of time. From our perspective, it's probably years. Um, from theirs, it's, the time is measured differently. And that there are markers along the way to signify the travel. And the final marker, it's almost like the Star of Bethlehem, the final marker is in the sky. At least that's the way the stories go. And and indicates that the people are to stop where food grows on water. And food grows on water in northern Minnesota and northern Wisconsin. And, you know, in the Lake Superior watershed, um, you have wild rice. And that becomes not only a staple of the Ojibwe diet, it becomes a sacred staple of the diet. So it plays, it plays a, both a role as, as, as physical and spiritual nourishment. So th that food stuff's pretty interesting, and the fact that it grows here and plays that important part in that migration story. Um, that, that kind of indicates that Madeline Island sort of then sets itself up as, as that center of that cosmos. And it's considered, from the Ojibwe that I know, it's considered to be the center of that cosmos today. I mean, it's a very, very special place to them. Great, because that'll be a nice segue to actually talking to an Indian. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. there you go. Okay, so, yeah. and you're comfortable. You know, what I do more, know more about is what happens when those cultures encounter each other. Tell uh, me about that. I got the camera rolling. 
Well, one of the things that, one of the lessons that we like to impart to our visitors at the museum is, it, it, one of the central ideas is that throughout the total of human history up here, all peoples who have ever lived here, from the very first people to the people who live here today, their livelihoods are dependent upon the natural resources of this region. We call it tourism today, but 500 years ago, it was subsistence. It was the Ojibwe living, in, living here in, in relative harmony with, with the natural environment and everything they need they had to find around them. Uh, the first encounter is with, is with French in this area, and the French um, are looking for resources that they can exploit and ship back to Europe. And what they find up here are furs, in particular the beaver. And beaver fur is used to make fancy felt top hats. And they go into trade. They start a, a fur trade with uh, the indigenous people here. And that's an economy of the, of the region based on natural resource use. And that lasts 150 years. And by the time you get to the 19th century, um, the, that encounter has continued for multiple generations. And then you get another wave of European immigration and it's Scandinavians that come to this area. And they are also creating a livelihood for themselves based on natural resource use. And it's all about fishing and logging and, and in the Apostle Islands, it's brownstone quarrying. Mm -hmm. And then by the 1890s, we get the next economy and it's tourism, but it's still based on natural resource use because the, the tourism here is, it, is uh, appreciating, exploring, participating actively in the landscape and the waterscape. Um, so the, the entire human history here has all been, always been about natural resource use and how people relate to environment. So that's, to me, that's a very fascinating story. Uh, and it speaks well of that initial encounter uh, because it was different uh, with the Ojibwe. Their encounter with the French was fortuitous in a lot of ways because there was no fur trade and no economy for the French for the better part of 100 years from the 1650s, from the 1550s to the 1650s. There is no economy of fur trade without active participation of native peoples. That's the way it worked. In fact, French Canadians um, the, the folks who did that hard work of the fur trade, one of the very first things you did is that you married into Indian families. And by doing so, you expanded your labor force and you made all those familial connections which allowed you access to different territories and different sources of furs and then you build the fur trade from that. And to do that for multiple generations means that by the time the British in the, in the 1760s, and then the French, uh, not, excuse me, the, uh, the Americans by, by 1815, by the time they take over the fur trade, um, it's a well-established culture. It's not just a business up here. It's not just uh, going into, an, into the landscape and, and exploiting natural resources. It's, it's, it's a culture. It's a mixed culture. I mean, we even use the word Métis to describe it. And that mixed culture lasts right through the British and American fur trades and is still alive and well today, especially on the North Shore of Lake, of lake Superior. You go up into, into Ontario among First Nations up there and Métis culture is, is, is alive and well. So, um, you know, to go back to something you said earlier, mm -hmm. you probably shouldn't move that around. So, Nervous. It's a bad habit, yeah, because I'm putting a lot of pressure in here. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, just, stop I'm just camera. squirmy. I, I, I'm going to stop the camera because I want to make sure you're comfortable with the next question. So, what, you know, the island, what's, what's special about the island? Well, when I think about the island, I, th I think about just the whole region, about the Apostle Islands, Bayfield Peninsula, Shawamigan Bay. And it's been a, a refuge for, for people for countless generations. Certainly, you, you, can go back to, you can go back to the first peoples and think about S Madeline Island typically was visited by the Ojibwe in the summertime, the best time of year. The fishing's good, and it's just a beautiful place to be. And, and that's unchanged over the generations. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting question that you pose because my wife's family uh, were Scandinavian immigrants in the 1890s to Washburn. And only one of the sons ever left home. The rest of them stayed. And they stayed partly because 
it's quiet, everybody knows each other, and there's not much to do, which is a good thing. <laughs> and my, my mother-in-law came up here from Chicago in the summertime to do nothing. And my wife came out here from all the way from Wyoming when she was a kid to do nothing in Washburn and explore Madeline Island. And when we got married and we started our family, uh, we did the same thing. We came up here because it's quiet and there's nothing fancy about the place. And it's just a great place to sit back, soak up the natural environment. You know, for some people it's a, it's a deeply spiritual place and they, they get that kind of sustenance from it. For the rest of us, it's just, it just beats the heck out of living in a big city. So you come here because it's quiet and everybody's friendly and everybody knows each other. And like I said, there's not a lot to do and that's a good thing. How about the notion that there's a chance to delve deeper? Well, I'm not very deep, so <laughs> I'm not I'm not one of those deep delvers. <laughs> I'd say you want to hey, you want to talk to somebody who's delving deep. Talk to a preacher, you know. I mean, I know there's <laughs> talk to Marina. Talk to Marina Lechecki. She's 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 both she's both a good a good the good island preacher and she's delving deep. <laughs> is she is she a native up here, or is she a transplant? No, she's a trans. Well, everybody's a transplant. I mean, basically, yeah. You know. No, she's she, she's she hasn't been here for forever, but how long would you think? Oh, I think Marina's been here 25, 30 years, maybe. That's enough to get to yeah. hear some credits. Yeah. But I mean, you know, all all kidding aside, she's the pastor at the UCC Church, and if you're looking for somebody who is one of those transplants who kind of discovered the place and then fell in love and then began to delve deep and find out that, from her perspective, there's something deeply spiritual about the place. She she could articulate that for you. I you know I can't because you already have. You know, I just I just have a different view of it. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe my idea of deeply spiritual is that it's a place where you can go that's quiet where there's nothing to do. Yeah, that's, 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 that's <laughs> certainly know, part of that. I think. You know. Um, uh, any impressions at all? You talked earlier a little bit about the the music camp. Are they good citizens? Are the kids? What any, anything you could say about that? Well, yeah, the, I I think the music camp is one of the is one of the wonders uh, of the Upper Midwest. Frankly, uh, just just to have a place where world class musicians can come to the island and again soak up that nothing to do except make music, except come here and make art, and then pass along their skills, their knowledge, their love of music to a, a next the younger generation that are up and coming. That's a very special thing. I had a remarkable encounter recently at the museum where the parents of a young woman who was one of the very first students at the music camp came to the museum and we started chatting about all things island and music camp and this and that. And they told me that their daughter who started off as a high school kid at the music camp is now a professional musician and an instructor at the music camp. And I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever heard. That was just so perfect because it kind of sums up why Madeline Island just gets under people's skin. And you can use that, that example from the music camp to illustrate that. Once, you, once it gets into you, there's no letting go. And you come back. And so here she is coming back, and now she's going to teach. So then that early generation comes back and teaches the next generation. It's pretty cool. I'm a victim of that, too. You're a victim? Yeah, I've been coming up here for years. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I. Uh, they had... A daughter and two sons, and they were all in the arts. Right, one of them, one of them was a filmmaker, um, and um, and I think they were all influenced to some degree by, first of all, their parents' interests, but certainly by get, by their parents giving them the opportunity to really blossom, and the music camp does that for a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's kind of a special place. Uh, you know Tom George at all? I do a little bit. Since it's the 30th anniversary, do you know, know him well enough to say something nice about it, him and the job he does up here? Hey, happy anniversary and congratulations, Tom. You're doing good work, man. Say it again because I think I stepped on your line. <laughs> That'd be a nice thing to Hey, say. Tom, happy anniversary. Congratulations. You guys do great work. Good. Rolling now. Well, I, th I think the closest humans come, from my perspective, to touching the divine 
to approaching something deeply spiritual is through creativity, through the arts. And I think, I think humans are hardwired to be creative, to, to make music, to paint pictures, to tell stories. Um, and that's why places like Madeline Island are so important because you have to have environments like that to, to both stimulate creativity but also to, to, to recharge you so that you can go and continue to make, to make those stories and, and to create that music and paint those pictures. Um, that's my perspective for whatever it's worth. It's worth a lot.